Asian investor, the only brand that helps real estate agents get off the real estate roller coaster. And today we're going to be talking about a topic that I realized I pretty much talk to every single person in my coaching program or people that I meet at our events about, but have never published the information online yet. And for better or worse, anytime that I talk to an agent that's looking to invest in real estate and they look a little bit about, they look at what we've done, what we've accomplished, um, they want to know how we've done it. And I always start with kind of the backstory um, and go through the details and the progressions that took place in our business in order to get from point A to point B, all by the way, starting with no money and no resources. And I, I say that only because it is common for somebody to say to me that they can't do some of the stuff that we do because they don't have money or they don't have a certain resource. And it's important for me to just state that when we started, we didn't have any resources. We didn't have any, you know, big capital or anything like that. But yet, you know, over the course of close to 20 years, um, you know, we've we've built a fix and flip company that flips 100 to 130 houses a year. We've built a real estate brokerage over the past six or seven years that's got 400 plus agents. Um, we built up a pretty significant rental property portfolio. We are in the process of building a few hundred apartment units. Um, and again, that's all starting from a place where, you know, we really didn't have any resources to start. So what I want to talk about today is not just, you know, how we did it, but I, I do want to even like address the question because people say to me all the time, one question I get asked all the time related to the subject is like, how do I scale my business? Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that specifically as I talk about how we built our business. But I do want to just address that really quick because that is something that I get asked all the time. And what I want to say is that everything that we've done and everything that anybody who's ever had any level of success at anything in life has done, um, it's a progression, right? So I, I want to address really quickly the myth that people go from zero to 100 or they go from you know, basically being flat broke to being worth a billion dollars like two two or three years from then. It is all progressions and it's all a step-by-step -step process. And when I talk about my story, you'll see that there are a lot of like ups and downs along the way for us. Our goal as mentors and coaches for agents that want to invest in real estate is to, is to take a more direct path than what I'm going to explain to you that we took. Um, but nevertheless, it's all a building block. So when we talk about scaling, yes, there are ways to, you know, grow your business significantly, but it is literally like building a house. Like you start with the foundation, you keep adding, you keep adding. And all of a sudden one day, you know, you've got this beautiful place to live, but it doesn't happen all at once. Um, so I was just on a call with somebody and I, I was explaining to them, they were talking to me about the progress that they've made. And saying like, how can I go faster? How can I scale? And my answer was really that they were doing most of the right things. They just need to actually be a little bit more patient because some of the stuff takes time. Okay. But I'm going to talk about our story. Like, how do we do this? How do we build up the fix and flip business? How do we manage our projects? How do we find deals? How do we, you know, manage the brokerage, build the brokerage? Why do we build the brokerage? Uh, why do we buy rental properties? How do we scale that up? How do we get the capital? And um, just to give you guys kind of like the start to finish on potentially, maybe what's your next three, five or 10 years, um, you know, into the future might look like. OK, so I, I think for me and I think for everybody that's listening, you know, building something, building a business, investing in real estate, doing something that's important. It all starts with like a big desire to improve. Um, I've told many of you this individually. Sometimes I talk about it, you know, outwardly as well. But, you know, I, I grew up, um, you know, without a lot of money. And that motivated me, like, from a really young age that I wanted to make money. I wanted to be successful, whatever that meant. The idea in my head that 
I didn't want to have to worry about money anymore. I wanted to be successful. And I, I got those feelings at a young age, seeing you know my family struggle with money. Okay. So nothing huge negative happened to me while I was a kid, but I saw that struggle, wanted to overcome that, you know, not just for me, but for other people in my family, wanted to be able to help out, et cetera. So at a young age, like most people kind of know, you know, I was told, do good in school, get a good job, et cetera. And that's what I was on the path to doing. Uh, I love learning, but I don't love school. But so I did really well in school because I thought that that was the path, right? Again, I'm going to talk about like, this is a long journey for me and my partners. Um, yours can be, yours can be shorter, right? That's what we're here to do to help. So 2003, read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, actually listened to it on audio while I was driving around in my, you know, white Kia Sophia um, in the year 2003, while I was delivering pizzas and 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 as soon as um you know I I heard that audiobook I realized I wanted to own a business I realized I wanted to be in real estate in some way shape or form but never actually did a deal for 6 years okay this is an important part of my story this is an important part of how we grew right so I consider myself to have been in real estate for 20 years Right, it's 2024. I got my real estate license in 2005. I read the book Rich Dad Poor Dad in 2003. In 2003, for me, is really when I started my journey. But it took me, you know, six years to do my first deal. Why did it take me six years to do my first deal? Because I didn't have a mentor, because I didn't have a coach, because I didn't know what I was doing. So what I did in the beginning was I just, you know, got my real estate license and started helping people buy and sell real estate. I thought that that was a very valuable experience. If you're listening on this podcast now, you probably buy it. You help other people buy and sell real estate. Um, what I liked about it is I remember I got my first check for 7,500 bucks. Being like 22 years old, I never had that much money in my bank account. Was super excited to get that payday and kind of got addicted to helping people, you know, buy and sell homes and making pretty good money selling real estate. Um, but Again, from 2003 to 2009, I never did my first investing deal because I never had a mentor that could help me. I never knew what to do. And it, it's just different, right? Trying to be an investor in real estate. If you want to learn how to sell houses, you can join any big box brokerage. You can join our brokerage. You can join anywhere. And there are programs available to help you teach you how to sell real estate. But yet there aren't really as many resources available, especially back in 2003, to help people learn how to invest in real estate. So the path was a little bit unclear. And it wasn't until I got a mentor in late 2008 that I did my first deal in 2009. Um, my first deal was 13 Cameron Ave in Somerville, Massachusetts. Um, that was a deal I had a listing appointment, went on the listing appointment, the seller was a hoarder, didn't want, um, didn't want to list her house, even though I tried every which way to try to get her to list the house because I thought it was the best thing for her, thought it was the best thing for me. But she told me, hey, if you can't find a direct buyer for my property, like I'm just going to talk to somebody else. So that was when my mentor stepped up, said, hey, like, let's do this investing deal. They walked me, you know, how to turn that, that deal into money. And long story short, I turned that property into a $115,000 profit in 2009. Um, again, that address 13 Cameron Avenue, Somerville, it is the address that my company is named after. Okay. So again, took me six, deal, six years to do my first deal. That time frame is important. That time frame probably should have been a little bit less. But what I, what I want to get across to people is two things. Number one, your first deal is always going to be your hardest deal. If you haven't done an investing deal yet, don't get discouraged. I mean, you heard kind of some of my stacks in the beginning of this, this episode. Um, you know, I, I listen, I'm not the world's biggest real estate investor, but I've had, you know, a decent amount of success in the industry and took me six years to do my first deal. So don't get discouraged if you haven't done your first deal. Second part to that story is, get a mentor, right? 
Um, get a mentor as soon as you can. We have mentorship opportunities in our inner circle program. If you don't want to join our inner circle program for any reason, that's okay. Go out, find a mentor, learn from that person, get the help that you know that you need. Okay. Um, so from there, you know, you, we got a check for $115,000. I said, oh man, like I've been on this real estate roller coaster with my income going up and down and up and down for several years. It takes me, I don't even make $115,000 in a whole year. How can I do more of these deals? So that's when I really decided to commit to learning how to find deals. The number one skill of any real estate investor is to learn how to find deals. People will say, oh, I can't do investing because I don't have money or I don't know how to rehab houses or I don't know how to build properties or I don't know the construction. I don't have the money. I can't do a deal. It's completely incorrect, right? And with our agent partnership program, if you go out, you find a deal, we'll put up the money, we'll do the construction, we'll split the profits 50-50, all right? Everybody who's a, a listener and a follower of me on Facebook knows that. By the way, if you like my content, make sure that you follow me on Facebook by going to Tommy Caffarella, T-O-M-M-Y, and then my last name, C-A-F-A-R-E-L-L-A. -L -L -A. Follow me. Um, I put out new content every single day on Facebook. Um, so yeah, I, I committed to learning how to find deals because I learned from doing that first deal and making $115,000 that I didn't need money or I didn't need to know how to do construction to make money as an investor. I needed to learn how to do deals. So a big part of my path was really becoming an expert in generating seller leads, generating seller appointments. So I, I learned everything I could. I, I joined coaching programs. Um, I studied, I watched YouTube videos, I mean, anything that you can think of. And then I tested and tried all the variety of different seller generation strategies. And really, like, I've talked about this on the show many, many times, and we teach people how to use all these methods. But really, the things that work well are your sphere of influence, social media, um, agent networking, mailers, pay-per-click. Facebook, um, calling, door knocking, text messaging. Like those are the things that work, right? Those are the things that, you know, most people can do. We teach and train on that stuff all the time. If you're not sure how to do any of those strategies or you want to learn more about those strategies, make sure that you register for our upcoming event at www.agentinvestorevent.com. Again, that's www.agentinvestorevent.com. But I, but I digress. But again, a big part of my journey, a big part of my skill set is that I am responsible in my company. One, one of my primary responsibilities is for, for my team to go out and meet with between 100 and 150 sellers a week. Sounds like a lot. It is a lot. But it didn't start that way. You know, I remember when I had a goal of, of meeting with two sellers per week. I remember not hitting that goal, not even being able to hit two, two sellers per week. And again, a conversation that I had earlier this morning, you know, somebody was talking about their business. It was a similar business to ours, but a lot smaller. And they said something that I had to kind of like jump in on where they said, um, they said, well, we're nowhere near the level that you're at. And I said, well, hold on. There's not a lot of difference between the level I'm at and the level you're at, right? Like, you're doing similar stuff to what we're doing. We're just doing more of it, right? We're doing more of it, but the business itself is the same. So I became a master in generating seller appointments. If you're an inner circle member and you have any questions about, you know, how to how to get seller appointments, how to generate them, I could I could give a two day course on seller appointment generation because again, I can't stress this enough. It's the number one most important skill. To being an agent investor. And I have to point out, like as an agent, just as a retail agent, um, getting seller appointments has never been more critical with all the stuff that's been going on with NAR, with potential issues with buyer agency and buyer agents getting paid. Like just as an agent, you want to be a seller appointment generator. So I became an expert in that. I learned everything that I could on how to generate seller appointments. 
And that's how we started to air quotation scale a little bit, the flipping business. So again, we're talking like 2009, 2010, 2011. And we went, we tried to go fast, but we went, you know, fairly slowly. We started out doing, you know, one flip here, yeah, another flip there. Um, you know, in our first year, we probably did, you know, two to four flips, you know, nothing crazy. I mean, I was always out there hunting and looking for deals. And the structure that I have in my company, the same structure that I have today is I'm responsible for the sales and marketing side of my business. I'm the front facing person. You guys probably all know me. You don't know my partners. That was by design, right? So I'm, I'm responsible for bringing in deals bringing in capital for my business, being the front facing person that's teaching and training on the back end, you know, once we get a deal, um, my partners are the ones who renovate the houses and do all the operations part of the business. Now, if you're starting out and it's just you, like people say, Hey, how do you scale or how do you get bigger? If you're starting out and you're the one that has to do everything in the beginning, that's okay. Right in the beginning, you may have to be the one doing everything. You're going to always wear more hats in the beginning of your business than in the future. That's okay. So, the key in the beginning is that you've got to work as smart as you can. You've got to look at how you're spending all of your hours. Am I spending my hours the most effective way? That's something that in the inner circle we help people with. Give me your hours. Let's look to see if they're the most efficient hours you can. Because if you're a one person operation and you've got 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 hours a week, you better be, be using systems and tools to make sure that you're not wasting time in your business. And again, like as you know, we're talking about how we grew our business. As you grow your business in the beginning, you're doing everything. So you need to be so, so good at time management and systems and making sure that you're doing things that aren't wasting time utilizing technology the right way, et cetera. So in the beginning, as you're talking about building a bigger business and air quotation scaling, you've got to manage your time the right way. Make sure you have a mentor that you can say, hey, this is how I'm spending my 40 hours, poke holes in this. Um, and you've probably got to work, you know, just being completely honest, you've probably got to work a little bit harder in the beginning than you're going to have to down the road. Like you're going to have to put in more hours. Like I don't know too many ways around that. Um, you know, somebody that I was talking to earlier today, they said, well, you know, you don't have to give me all your secrets, but I've got a question. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. there are no secrets. You know, one of the, one of the biggest secrets is that um, you can have the path, but it doesn't mean you're going to do it. Meaning that getting from point A to point B, especially in the beginning, may require you sacrificing more than maybe you're willing to give up. So part of our journey and part of how we help people um, is really clearly articulating what is required in order, to, in order to get the result that you want. So it is going to take a lot. Um, so, you know, you're in, we were in the beginning, we're doing a few flips a year. Well, you know, we get to a point where, okay, well, we don't have enough capital, right? So, um, you know, in the beginning phases, like we needed to put together a fund, which we did for our flipping business. So I, I went out, learned how to raise capital, learned how to do it the right way. Um, and we raised a fund to fund our fix and flip business, which took a while, right? So again, I'm the front facing sales and marketing person. Um, most important skill when it comes to investing is deal finding. But another highly important skill is learning how to raise capital. And that's, again, something that we teach and train on. I've been in coaching programs on how to raise capital, how to do it, how to make it a win-win, what the offering should look like. And so phase two for us, after we, we were doing, you know, two or three or four or five flips a year, was to raise capital so that we could do more and ramp up our marketing efforts so that we could get more opportunities. Right. So so as we kind of grew, you know, we we might have done like 10 or 15 in the second or third year. And I remember um, at that point setting a goal and saying, I want to do 52 houses in a year. I want to do one per week. 
And I remember as I was writing it out and I put it up on the board, um, you know, for my partners to look at, I remember like feeling like not confident that it was going to happen. Almost like, you know, when, when somebody says like, I want to be worth, you know, a million bucks or I want to make a hundred thousand dollars per year. And it's just kind of like a round number. But I remember I set that goal of doing, you know, 52 in a year. And then I work backwards to say, what needs to happen for us to do 52 in a year, a couple of years into the future. And I mapped all that out. And long story short, we ended up hitting it. Like, I don't know if we hit it in the next 18 months or two years, or as I'm getting a little bit older and I've got four kids, my memory isn't as great as it used to be. But I do know that we hit that goal of 52 housing a year fairly quickly. Um, one of the things that we did at that point to get more deals was agent networking. So you guys know that we've got this agent partnership program now where if an agent brings us a deal, we'll put up the money, we'll do the construction, we'll split the profits 50, 50 back then what I did, and this was around 2011, 2012 was I joined, um, I joined a big box retail residential retail brokerage and um network with the agents in that brokerage and at that point i was a licensed broker but i wanted to sell underneath this big box company to network with the agents and it's a big company if i said the name every single person on this call would know it and they have a lot of small offices in my area well i shouldn't say small like they have a lot of 50 to 100 person offices in my area probably a thousand agents in my state. And my goal was just to speak on investing, um, get referral deals from agents and to offer the agents, Hey, if you bring me a deal, we'll renovate the property and give you the listing back. That was kind of my value prop back then. It worked really, really well. But um, long story short, that big box brokerage didn't like the fact that I was teaching and training agents how to invest in real estate because they felt like it was taking away from agents um, selling homes, which to, I totally got, I don't agree with, but I respected the decision and I left. So this was probably around 2013. We were up to flipping 40 or 50 houses a year at this point. Um, and we were just starting to buy small multifamily rentals um, at that point. So what we were doing with the small multifamily rentals was that we would go out, we would be on the hunt for deals to flip. If we came across a two to four unit residential property, um, anywhere like an hour from Boston, um, and we could buy it at a discount and renovate it, we would then hold it. Okay, so the Burr strategy is a strategy that a lot of people on this call might be familiar with, but you know, it, it definitely like, needs to be repeated because it's it's one of the most fundamental concepts on how to build wealth without having a lot of money. Like everything I've been talking about so far, like we didn't have um, money to start. You know, that first deal that I, that I did and we made $115,000, we didn't put up any of our own capital. Okay. So we had a mentor that helped us with that, helped us do the deal with no, mo no money out of our own pocket. And then the more flips that we did, like we would just kind of move money from one deal to another. We learned how to raise money um, and, and got to a point where, okay, now we could do quite a few flips with the capital we've raised and the profits that we've had. Another critical component, and I know this is going to be hard, but I'm just telling you reality of building a business is saving more than you make. And, and what we used to do early on, we still do it to a large extent, but we were very diligent about it in our, you know, in our early to mid to late twenties was just taking enough out of the business to survive. Um, bare bones money. Like how do I, you know, make sure I eat? How do I make sure I pay my, my, um, my mortgage, but nothing more than that. And in the beginning, like we were working a lot and we were, we did, fairly well because we were putting a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into the business. Um, and so we were saving more than we made and we always plowed it back into the business. We always kept the money in the business, 
reinvest it back into the business. So this is a simple concept, but living below your means, especially in the beginning, is a very important thing. Why is it important? Well, let's say that you know you take enough money out of your business to live, and there's $200,000 left over that you technically don't need. You now have $200,000 of capital to deploy in your business, however you see fit to grow your business. So people talk about scaling their business. Well, part of scaling your business is to hire other people to do jobs and work within your business. How do you do that if you have no capital? You can't. So where I see a lot of people get um, you know, hit ceilings is that they're basically taking 100% of the money out of their company uh, rather than reinvesting it. And I know that this is easier said than done. And for some people that are listening to this right now, this is far beyond you know, what you need to know on day one. Like if you haven't done your first investing deal yet you're, or you're in the beginning phases of doing investing, you don't necessarily need to know everything that I'm talking about. This is uh, well into the future. But again, the whole purpose of this was to give you guys our story so that you can understand you know, what it takes to get from point A to point B. So we started accumulating small multifamily rentals along with the flips we were doing. Again, we're flipping maybe 50 houses a year. This is 2014, 2015. Um, and then when we come across a multifamily that we like, we're going to keep it, but we're going to burr it. We're going to buy it. We're going to renovate it. We're going to rent it. And then we're going to refinance it and get our money back. So what? Um, if you're not familiar with the burr strategy, it's kind of the cheat code on how to accumulate a lot of units without having a lot of capital. Because again, once you refi that property back out, you're getting most of your money back, if not more. Now, the more of these assets that you own, the more like houses and properties you can tap into. So you aren't just able to refinance a property once, but you can do it more than once as long as there's equity and a, you know uh, your lender allows you to do it. So we from from maybe 2014 to to 2019 we kept accumulating these small rental units got up to you know 100 150 200 plus um small multifamily units we kept increasing the amount of flips that we were doing we didn't have any crazy big jumps you know might have went from like 50 to 55 to 60 to 65 it was not that linear but you know we slowly grow that business all along with growing the brokerage. So after I left that big box brokerage, I never had any intention of really, you know, building out um, building out a brokerage. But what ended up happening was as I would speak and as I would teach, I would come across other agents who were at other brokerages that discouraged them from investing. And I would basically just say to them, my pitch back then was just, hey, Come to our brokerage, you know, no fees, good financials, and I'll teach you how to invest in real estate. As simple as that is, it's a very powerful message because we're going to give you better financials, which, yeah, anybody can change their financials, but we're also going to teach you how to build wealth through investing, which really nobody else still does for whatever reason. Um, so I just accumulated agents that way. Um and, and really without necessarily like pushing the recruiting to a large extent, the brokerage has never been a big money maker for us. For anybody that's thinking about building a brokerage versus investing, it's a no brainer. Um, I love my real estate agents. I've had many that have been with me for a very long time, but it's also an industry where people switch all the time. So let's just compare the two. Like if you have, I have 405 agents, I think, as of today, and I've got about the same number of units, right? Those 405 agents are probably not tomorrow, but they could. If I don't keep recruiting and keep trying to build, my agent count will, will fall. Whereas these the same number of units that I have that are rental units, those units are only going to go away if I decide they're going to go away. They're also going to increase in value, right? The most a real estate agent at my company can make me is $20,000. 
And we have something in our brokerage called the disappearing cap, where the cap goes from 20 to 18 to 16 to 14. So actually, my agent value and my brokerage goes down over time, whereas my rentals go up. So my brokerage has never been a big money maker for me. It's never been a big part of my wealth plan. It's just always been something that I've done because there's a need in the market. And I do like running a brokerage. I do like having a brokerage, but it's not, you know, compared to the rentals, it's kind of like a no brainer. So that's how we built our brokerage. I wish I could make it, you know, more complicated than that. But the reality is, is that, you know, the phrase that we say all the time, I say all the time on the show, sales will make you a living, investing will make you wealthy. The 405 or so agents that work for our company understand that. They understand that, you know, if you invest, if you've got 10 or 20 or $30,000 of passive income coming in every month, you don't have to worry about what the residential retail market is doing. You don't have to worry about whether your best friend is going to end up using a different agent, right? So investing is definitely more important. We don't tell people to stop selling real estate, but we advocate that they do um, invest as well as sell. So um, so from the 2014, 15 mark to maybe 2019, we accumulated all of those small rental units. We built up our brokerage to a couple hundred agents at that point, probably. And we got up to maybe, you know, flipping 70 or 80 houses. That was our business. Again, every step along the way, you know, critical things that we did. We saved as much money as we could. We reinvested back into the company as much as we could. We tried to keep our expenses as low as possible. Um, our expenses went up for the company because we were re reinvesting back into hiring people and setting up technology and stuff like that. But we weren't, you know, going out and, you know, buying expensive boats or cars or anything like that. And um, so I, I would kind of mark the next period as like the period where we started transitioning away from small multifamily into apartments. Some of you already know the story, but I told you guys how we were like building our rental property portfolio. When we found a great flipping opportunity that cash flowed, we would buy it. So we had a lot of small multifamily rentals all over the place. If you're from New England, you'll know some of these areas, but we had them in Worcester and we had them in Manchester, New Hampshire, and we had them in Fall River and we had them in Lynn and we had them in all of these different places all spread around. They were incredibly tough to manage along with being tough to manage. Um, it was just a lot of a lot of equity in those properties that could be deployed in other ways. So we made a pretty bold decision around 2019, 2020, that we were going to sell all of our small multifamily rentals and get into the apartment business, which we've been doing since then. Um, you know, the apartment business, uh, we, so again, like, how do we get into that? Because a lot of times people will say, I want to get into apartments today. And for most people, unless they partner with us, it's not exactly like super realistic. So we did a lot of smaller development, ground up, you know, six condos in a place or ground up, you know, three family that allowed us to learn the construction side of the business to then be able to build or heavily renovate a bigger building. So Again, all stepping stones, we didn't go right into apartments because we didn't know how to do the construction out of the gate. We also built up banking relationships from doing our smaller deals. We learned how to raise capital from doing our smaller deals. Um, we learned how to manage properties from our smaller deals. So us transitioning into apartments, which is where we feel now, this is our end game. So we operate our business now to grow our brokerage, do 100, 250 flips, um, and build one or two apartment deals per year, uh, 50 to 100 unit apartment deals per year. That's where we feel kind of good about, and that's where we've transitioned from, from 2020 to now it's 2024. We do a lot of that for me doing the front facing stuff with agent investor. Um, partnering with agents on deals, um, raising capital, 
um, from agents who want to be a part of these bigger deals, building our brokerage from people that are attracted to the message of investing in real estate, the message of sales will make you a living, investing will make you wealthy. Um, and that's where we feel like we're going to be kind of moving forward. Um, I'm 41 now, I'll be 42 in July. And, you know, again, like looking back, you know, high level when people say, well, how do you do this stuff? How did you get there? Um, I want to reiterate some of the important points, I think, you know, of how we kind of got here. And I, I think these are the, these are the takeaways that I would, I would say to everybody that wants to achieve anything. Like you don't have to want to do exactly what we did, but I, I do want to mention like how we did the stuff that we did it and you know, why it was kind of like important. So just like a couple of things that I would keep in mind. First, you've got to have the burning desire to succeed. Um, you want to do anything great in life, anything that you call big in life, there has to be a you know, driving force behind it. It can't be something that you just kind of maybe want to do. Um, this stuff requires sacrifice. It requires you working hard on a day-to-day -day basis. It doesn't mean that you're going to give up your life entirely or anything crazy like that. But it just means it can't be passive. So you've got to really want it. Um, if you don't want it, it's not going to happen by accident. Okay, so you've got to want it. Second thing I would say is you've got to, as as best you can, set goals and figure out what you want out of it. You know, when, when somebody joins our Inner Circle program, we take them through our five-step process to figure out like where, what they really want investing to do for them. And I, I always tell the story of like a few different people that essentially have gone through our program and are retired now. And some of their lifestyles are not what I would want. Like they, some of them live super basic. Like they could live off of 50 grand a year. Like, I mean, it, they, they can live very lean and that's what they want to do. They just want to travel or enjoy time off and not really, you know, grind anymore or whatever the reason is, but you've got to figure out like what you want investing to do for you. Like I want, I want investing to do different things for me than the people I just mentioned. Everybody has a little bit different thing, but you've got to write that out and at least get a clear understanding as best you can in the beginning of where you want, because then you've got to map out everything and you've got to say, Hey, I need a scorecard every week to say like, okay, I need to make this many phone calls. I need to talk to this many agents. I need to give this many speeches, et cetera. Another important thing that I think um, I should say is like, you have got to make a decision, in my opinion, to stop worrying about what other people think and doing things that maybe make you a little bit uncomfortable. I'm talking about if you want like big results. So I'll tell you guys a quick story about me, right? You know, I'm here talking. I, I speak at my events. Um, I also have a lisp, right? You guys can probably hear it right now. I'm not the best speaker. Uh, when I was a little kid, like I used to go to speech therapy and I was embarrassed about it. And in class, when I was a young kid, I'm talking like seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old. Like I wouldn't raise my hand. I wouldn't talk because I was embarrassed. And so when I realized that I needed to probably public speak um, in order to achieve my goals, that was tough for me, right? And I hear a lot of people say things like, oh, I don't want to post too much on social media or like I can't publicly speak or I can't make that call or I can't make that text. This is where it goes back to like the desire and, you know, figuring out like how important is this to you? because if this is really important to you, if the outcome is that important, like it is important for me to be able to make sure that like my parents don't need to work right now. My parents worked hard all their life. They never saved up any money because they never made any money, but it was important for me to be able to help my parents as they got older. So I had to make a decision. Am I going to do a live stream, do a podcast, speak at an event, post on social media? I don't like doing any of that stuff. 
but I had to make a decision on whether or not I was going to push myself. So part of this process and part of the growth that we ha we've had is that everybody in our company has said, I'm going to sacrifice and I'm going to do things that are a little bit outside of my comfort zone. And yeah, it's not something that you necessarily want to do, but I can tell you right now, as I'm recording this, I have no fear of publicly speaking. I could speak in front of 10,000 people. I wouldn't even remotely get nervous um, because I do it, right? What you do every day becomes a habit. You don't get nervous about the stuff that you habitually do because your brain knows there's no danger in doing it. It's only in the beginning. So that's just another key component. Like once you, you got to figure out what you need to do every day. Once you figure out what you need to do every day, you have to do it. Part of doing it means working hard, doing some stuff you don't want to do, and maybe overcoming some fears by forcing yourself. Okay. So we talked about having a clear plan, having the motivation, stepping outside of your comfort zone. Um, this is going to sound completely self-serving, but I have to say it because it's true. You need mentors like in this space, in every space. I talked about the fact that it took me six years to do my first deal. Could have taken me like a year or two if I had a mentor. Um, when you don't have a mentor, the fear, the unknown gets in the way, right? Like if you, if you think about like anything that you've ever done in your life, right? Like riding a bike. There was probably somebody there that said, no, you got to do it. You know, just keep pedaling. Your parents probably took off the training wheels and they said, go. And then you probably still were scared, but then eventually you did it, right? And then once you did it, you got accustomed to doing it. So there's so many reasons why having a mentor is important, but ultimately it comes down to accountability, shortcuts, and avoiding mistakes. And that's what we do. You know, if you're listening and you've not jumped on a call with me to talk about what our mentorship program looks like, go to www.agentinvestorinnercircle.com and set up a time to talk. Um, on that call, we'll discuss, you know, what you're trying to achieve. We'll, you know, build out a roadmap for you and we'll, we'll answer questions, right? So with all that being said, um, you know, other things that are important to this journey is enjoying what you're doing. Uh, be happy with the progress you're making and always look back, you know, six months at a time, a year at a time to say, am I better than I was six months ago or a year ago? If the answer to that is no, you're doing something wrong. If the answer to it is yes, but you're not satisfied, understand that you're probably never going to be satisfied fully and that that's part of the process. Um, Living below your means, we talked about that, hugely important. Reinvesting back into your business, reinvesting back into yourself through education, through hiring, through marketing, through sales, et cetera. And those are, those are the big ones. And this stuff is all going to come. And when I first got into the business, a guy by the name of Mike Herney, who's still um, you know, involved in the greater Boston area, he said something that stood with me. You may have heard me say this before, but if you live 10 years like nobody else will, you'll live the rest of your life like nobody else can. Where most people struggle with this is they want the results in a year and three months and six months. Look, I do too. You're not a human if you don't want the results quickly. But understand that big results take time. You know, they don't have to take 10 years, but they're not going to happen in six months and two months. And consistency is the most important thing. Like getting up every day and putting in effort doesn't have to be a Herculean effort, but you have to work on getting better each and every day. You do everything that I just mentioned um, in this episode today, you are going to achieve more than you, than you think you're capable of. And you're going to achieve more than 95% of people, maybe even more than 99% of people. Uh, because most people don't do any of this stuff. And this is the this is how I'm going to end this this uh, episode. And it's it's going to be on a note that's going to sound negative. But I, I say it only because I care and only because I want people to get the results. 
we make things so easy for people that follow us. It's crazy. Yet so many people still won't even take the time to come to our event. They won't take the time to listen to our podcasts. They won't take the time to read the Facebook post. They won't take the time to read the emails. They won't join the inner circle. All of this stuff is set up for a reason, right? Most people just consume information a little bit at a time and never take action on it because they don't do the rest, right? I hear people say, oh, I can't make it out to your event because I'm all the way in XYZ town. Then I Google the town and it's a 40 minute drive. Go look, <laughs> I, I'd be willing to, to sit on a plane for 24 hours if it meant that I was going to improve um, in my business, if I thought it was going to move the needle. Um, so with all that being said, like you've got to take action. It doesn't have to be with us, but if you think that we can help you, get to our event at www.agentinvestorevent.com. Go through the podcast episodes that we have. That's probably the biggest hidden gem that you can come across is by going back and listening to podcast episodes. Why? Because they're free and you can do them on demand, right? So while you're at the gym, while you're walking around the house, while you're cleaning, um, turn on the podcast episode. While you're in your car, turn on the podcast. Um, am I going to sit here and try to entertain you all day long and you know make you be make you compelled to listen to me? Probably not, but I guarantee if you listen to 20 episodes of our podcast, you are going to get a different perspective on investing that you didn't have before, and you're going to get those building knowledge blocks that you need in order to get from point A to point B. So that's our journey, and it's been you know almost 20 years you know doing this. I've got you know well more than another 20 years to go. I'm excited to see what our company can achieve. Um, what I can achieve, what I can do for my family. <clears throat> I'm excited to get more agents on board with this mission. Um, our podcast keeps growing every single month. Our email list keeps growing every single month. My Facebook account, my followers keep growing every single month. I know that this message is resonating with people. I know I'm the only one out there that's giving this message. Why, again, I don't know. But I'm excited to see what we can do in the next 20 plus years. I hope you guys take this mission with me <clears throat> because this is not just for yourself, but it's for your family and future generations. You learn how to do this stuff. You learn and you execute on building a rental property portfolio or a short-term rental portfolio or a fix and flip business. Um, you're gonna. It's not just about you. It's about setting you know the rest of the people in your life up for success moving forward. Again, I talked about my parents. Um, you know, I talked, I got my, I got four kids. I'm married. You know, this isn't all about me. Like I have already achieved for myself, the needs that I have. I have everything that I could want in life. So it's about helping other people. It's about future generations. And I know that as you're listening to this, there's somebody out there that you want to help. You've got to help yourself first, but once you've helped yourself, you've got to help other people and you can do that through investing. So I hope that you guys got value out of this. I hope that some of the stories and some of the path that we've taken has resonated with you. I told you it took 20 years. It would have taken me far less time had I had a mentor the entire time. Probably could have done it in 10 years. Um, so I appreciate you guys jumping on, listening. Please come to our event, and I hope to see you guys soon. Thank you. Bye.